So today's video is going to be another solved true crime case. Today we're going to be doing our first ever, I think, celebrity murder. I don't think I've ever done another one. If I have, I'm going to sound really, really stupid. But <laughs> I think this is our first. Today we're going to be talking about the murder of Lana Clarkson. But quickly before we get into this video, I just want to thank Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. I get tons of comments like on my videos and social media asking me about my hair care routine. And to be honest, I don't really have a routine. Literally the only products I really use on my hair are obviously shampoo and conditioner. I don't really do hair masks or anything like that. Most shampoos and conditioners are pretty vague in the things that they claim they can do for your hair, but not Function of Beauty. Function of Beauty's products are made custom for your hair and your personal hair goals. You basically just go on the website, fill out a super quick two minute quiz about your hair type and your hair goals that you want to achieve and Function of Beauty will formulate you a shampoo and conditioner that is perfect for your hair. You can customise your products down to like their colour and their fragrance. These are mine, how cute are these? I chose Seafoam Green for my shampoo and Yellow for my conditioner. The fragrance I chose was Vanilla Milkshake and I also chose Strong. <laughs> because I like when I can still smell the shampoo on my hair like the next day after washing it. My personal hair goals included oil control because I, my hair gets super greasy super quickly and you've seen how much I've used of these and I can already say that my hair does last longer between washes. Function of Beauty's products have no parabens, no sulfates, no GMOs, no toxins, they are vegan and 100% cruelty free. Oh, I've just shaken that up. The products do come with pumps, by the way. I personally don't use mine just because I travel with them a lot. It's a lot easier just to keep putting the lid on. But if you do just keep your shampoo and conditioner at home, if you don't travel that much, then these might be really helpful. Function of Beauty is currently available in all the countries that you see on screen right now. You can click the link down below in the description to get 20% off your first order. You're welcome. But yeah, thanks again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. Now let's get into the case. But before we do, I just want to give my usual disclaimer that I mean absolutely no disrespect to anyone that I talk about in this video. This video is for educational purposes and everything that I'm about to say is just information that I have found on the internet and I'm compiling into one video. So Lana Jean Clarkson was a 40 year old woman born on April 5th, 1962 in Long Beach, California to Donna and James Clarkson. She had a brother named Jesse and a sister named Fawn and as far as I could tell, the Clarkson family were a happy little family. They lived in California and everything was going well. That was until Lana's father passed away when she was still a teenager. After her father's death, the family moved to Los Angeles and it was there that Lana realised that she could do whatever she wanted with her life. She could be whatever she wanted to be. She was really inspired by living in LA. Like she loved Hollywood, she loved the entertainment industry as most teenagers do and did at that time. It was all a very new thing. And Lana herself was very conventionally beautiful. She was tall, slim, blonde and she really saw an opportunity for herself to make it in that kind of industry. She began modelling and kind of dipping her toe into the fashion industry. She tried out little acting jobs until acting started to gain a little bit of momentum. In 1982, Lana landed a role in the film Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and then the year after that, she landed a role in the movie Scarface. But Lana's most famous roles, the ones that she's most well known for, were in five different Roger Corman films. Now, these films were all kind of low budget films, but she was always a main-ish role and in two of them she was actually the lead role. These five films included Deathstalker, Barbarian Queen and Barbarian Queen 2 and Lana was the Barbarian Queen. And these roles that she had were very clearly aimed at men. It was a very sexualized, like strong warrior woman type character, very much like Lara Croft. That's probably a bad, <laughs> probably a bad comparison. But she had like big boobs and she was always wearing low cut tops and like in certain scenes she was naked. It was very aimed at a very particular audience. And this audience was like ones that would go to comic book conventions and low budget movie conventions. And she was pretty well known in those circles. Don't get me wrong, she wasn't a mainstream star at any point in her career. She never really got that big break to take her into the big 
films and the big roles. But she was like a celebrity in those smaller circles. She would sign autographs and take pictures at conventions and things like that. And while she was most well known for those roles, they weren't her only roles. She was in a horror film called The Haunting of Morella and a thriller named Vice Girls. She was in many different TV series, although I don't think she was a main character or at least like a big character at any point. I think she, a lot of the roles that Lana had, she was like a supporting character or like an extra. I don't even think supporting character is the right word. I think she was probably just in a couple of scenes per film or TV series. She was in a lot of TV adverts, I know that. She did a lot of photo shoots still. She was still in the kind of modeling and fashion industry while she was in all these TV shows and movies. And she did pretty well in the modeling as well. She would travel all over the world for photo shoots and things like that. But again, she never really broke into the mainstream of modeling either. She wasn't on the big runaways. She wasn't on the big, um, magazine covers and things. Alongside her career, Lana also did a lot of charity work for an aid charity named Project Angel Food. She worked with them every week and she would go and deliver food to people suffering from HIV and AIDS. And this was in the 1980s. This was when AIDS was kind of feared among the public. No one really understood it. It was still very stigmatised and looked down upon. And this was before Freddie Mercury passed away. This was before anyone high profile really came out and said that they had AIDS and so everyone looked at Lana as if she was insane for doing this because no one really understood it and everyone looked down on it and looking back Lana was brave to do that even though we know that you can't catch it from touch or anything like that but Lana was very kind-hearted and she knew what she wanted to do she knew that she wanted to help people when Lana reached her 30s the tv roles and the modeling roles and the movie roles were kind of slowing down and she could no longer make a full-time living doing what she used to but she wasn't ready to go to a normal life she still wanted to be Lana Clarkson she still wanted to be in the entertainment industry because she loved it and so she decided to make up her own fan website where her fans could come and talk to her directly through like the chat on this website and on there she would sell copies of her own movies but she would sign them so that she could make a profit and then she would send them out. Lana's friends and family and her manager and everyone recall her being a little bit down about this. She wasn't depressed by any means and she was still quite a happy person in general, but she did really miss being in the entertainment industry. She really wanted to get back in there somehow. And she was thinking about how she could do this for a long time. She thought about going into stand-up comedy, but she knew that that was gonna be hard because she was a good looking female and at that time and still now it's hard for women to get into comedy because there's such a stigma around women not being funny and so she wrote her own stand-up comedy scripts and whatever but she never really took them anywhere she performed them in front of her friends and family who said she was funny but that never really went anywhere and Lana really needed to make ends meet at this point the DVDs weren't selling like they used to her royalties were getting less and less as time was going on and so she decided to take up a job at a club named the House of Blues but this wasn't just any club, it wasn't like she was going and getting a job at a club and just giving up on her dream of being an entertainer. House of Blues was a very high profile club for very high profile people. There were rich people, celebrities, socialites, everyone came in there. A lot of people that worked in the entertainment industry came in there. And Lana's job at this club was to be beautiful pretty much. She was a hostess, she would let people in and out through the little red rope that they would like clip. That was her job. She was literally just hired to stand there, be beautiful, talk to clients, get them drinks if they wanted them, and she thought that this would be a really good opportunity to maybe meet some people in the industry, worm her way back in there, make some good connections. And it didn't take long for her to do that, actually. Just a few weeks into working at this club, Lana was hosting as normal, letting people in and out of this particular VIP room when a very, very well-known record producer comes in the club. His name was Phil Spector and he was significantly older than Lana. She was 40 years old at this point and he was 60. And Phil was, and still is, one of the most 
influential people in the whole music industry. He'd worked with the likes of the Ronettes and the Ramones, even the Beatles. Even if you've never heard of Phil Spector, you've definitely heard Phil Spector's music. Phil's career kicked off when he was in his late teens. He joined a boy band and this was just before boy bands really kicked off. It was just before the Beatles. It was like right at the beginning of that boy band craze. He joined this boy band. He was kind of the brains behind it all. So he was the one that was writing the music, mastering the music, mastering is mastering the word. But he was the one that kind of made the music what it was. And then it came to perform it live and Phil realized that he was not cut out for the boy band life. He had horrendous stage fright. He would get up on stage and he just couldn't sing. But he loved music and he was still really passionate about music and he wanted to stay in the industry and so he decided to go more behind the scenes of the boy bands. He decided to take up music production because like I said he was the brains behind all the boy band songs anyway so why not just do that for other people? Produce the music, write the music and he was really really talented and you can tell that from his work. He made songs such as Be My Baby by the Renettes and Baby I Love You by the Ramones which by the way are two of my favourite songs in the world. Imagine by John Lennon, Phil Spector was behind that. Unchained Melody the whole of the Let It Be album by the Beatles. Phil Spector was behind all of that and I can guarantee you've heard at least one song from Let It Be. Even the Christmas song, I've forgotten the actual title of it, War Is Over. War Is Over, I think it's called Happy Christmas, War Is Over. I know you've heard that, that was Phil Spector. And Phil's talent was very quickly recognised and he became a millionaire before the age of 21. And with all of this money and newfound fame, this new life that he'd created for himself, he went to LA and bought himself what he called the castle. Now this had 11 bedrooms, I believe, 33 rooms in total. And it was huge, it was beautiful. And he called it the castle, it was his baby. However, this life quickly started to consume Phil Spector. Music, he lived, breathed, ate music. Like that was his life. He never really formed meaningful relationships outside of music. So his only friends he had were work associates from the music industry. The only wives or girlfriends or, you know, any romantic partner he had, he met through music. He didn't just have friends at home, you know what I mean? Like I said before, he managed the girl band, the Ronettes, and he actually ended up marrying one of the Ronettes. Ronnie from the Ronettes. <laughs> now, no one knew this at the time until years and years later when Ronnie finally published an autobiography about her time in the music industry. But this relationship, this marriage that she had with Phil Spector was actually very abusive. It wasn't so much him physically hurting her, I believe he probably did on a few occasions, but it was more abusive in the way that he would get in her head and he would manipulate her and he would scare her and try and wear her down. He would point guns at her a lot and I know that sounds really bad and it is really bad, like don't take this next bit as me kind of justifying that at all but no one ever thought that he would kill anyone or shoot anyone or go through with his gun threats but this was a very Phil Spector thing to do to threaten people with guns like he would point them at people a lot if they were annoying him like when he's trying to get people to do things that he wants them to do he would just point a gun at them he owned like 10 different guns and he would just use them to scare people he never shot anyone and no one ever thought that he would shoot anyone so that doesn't make it okay by any means don't get me wrong but it definitely was scare tactics with him he would lock Ronnie in rooms when he left the house like he wouldn't let her leave certain rooms which again, is horrendously abusive. He also kept in the living room as an ornament, just a huge coffin, like a casket. And he would tell Ronnie over and over again that she will be in there one day. He was just an overall very strange man, very power hungry, very abusive and manipulative. And I just think he loved the power and he was scared of losing it because he got so much at such a young age. He would carry a gun with him everywhere he went just to kind of feel some power over everyone else that he was around. And don't take this as me justifying him either. At no point in this video am I trying to justify people's actions with guns. But Phil Spector was quite a small, slim, 
guy. He wasn't muscular, he wasn't, you know, he looked pretty weak and so people felt that he carried these guns to compensate for what he lacked in like physical scare tactics. <laughs> people that didn't know that he was the Phil Spector would try and pick on him because he's a little guy, like if they're in the bar they'll tease him or whatever and Phil would just whip out this gun and immediately they'd stop. Because even though he was one of the richest and most influential people in the music industry, no one knows what producers look like most of the time. But like I said, these were pretty much just scare tactics. He never really shot anyone. He never, he would shoot at things like the sky or whatever to scare people, but he would never shoot at people. One time in the studio with John Lennon, Phil Spector got really pissed off at something and he shot the gun in the air. And John Lennon turned to him and said, if you're gonna shoot me, just shoot me, but don't shoot for no reason. You're gonna deafen me and I need my hearing for my job. So for John Lennon to say something like that, he knew that Phil Spector wasn't gonna shoot him, but he just wanted him to stop shooting in general because it was annoying and it was loud. Anyway, back to the timeline. 40 year old Lana Clarkson is working as a nightclub host as usual on February 3rd, 2003 when 60-year-old Phil Spector walks in the club. Spector was already very intoxicated when he reached the House of Blues. He'd been drinking for five hours already before he got there, and he was on pills, and he was just very out of it. He'd actually been out drinking that night with two different women, so he took a woman out on a date, and then she had enough, she'd drunk enough, she wanted to go home, so he took her home, and then took another woman out to a different bar, carried on drinking with her, and then the two of them went to the House of Blues. So Spectre and his date arrive at the House of Blues, and as soon as they do, they walk upstairs, I believe, and I don't know what the situation was, but I think it was like a men's only area upstairs or something like that. And that was when Lana Clarkson spotted Phil Spector walking upstairs. She had no idea who he was and she walked up to him and stopped him. Now, like I said, Phil Spector was 60 years old at this point and he had lost a lot of his hair. So he used to wear different two pairs all the time and like he didn't hide the fact that he was wearing them. He used to wear like different colours, different styles, whatever. And on this particular day, he was wearing a long black curly one, like down to here at least. And from the back, Lana mistook Phil Spector for a woman. And so she walked over to him and said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am, you can't go up there. That's men only. Of course, Phil Spector was very upset. He started shouting at Lana. And so another hostess came over, pulled Lana aside and said, be careful, that's Phil Spector. He's very rich, very important. You need to treat him better. And so Lana was obviously very upset that she just embarrassed herself and embarrassed Phil Spector and he was very influential and she was trying to get in the industry and she just felt like she really messed up. And so she was running around for the rest of her shift making sure that Phil Spector liked her again. She was trying to get on his good side. She was getting him all the drinks he wanted, everything like that. And when Phil Spector and his date first sat down, he ordered just a shot of rum and his date ordered a water and he was not happy. He was like, you need to order a proper drink. He swore and everything. He said, you need to order an effing drink. And so this date ended up leaving because she didn't want to drink anymore. And that was when Phil Spector's attention turned to Lana Clarkson. And at the end of the night, Lana finished her shift around 2.30 a.m. that morning. She walked outside, she went out to the road to get a taxi home, and Phil Spector followed her out onto the street. He approached her outside and just said, will you please come back with me? We can go back to my castle and have a drink. You can stay over. I've got so many bedrooms. Like, he really liked her. He really fancied her. She was a beautiful woman. And Lana said, oh, you know, I can't, like, I don't really know you that well. I can't really come over. You've been drinking for so long. Like, it wouldn't be right. And he was saying, no, please. Like, I really want to get to know you. I really want to have a drink. And eventually Lana said yes. And so they got into his chauffeur-driven limousine and drove back to his castle. And then just two hours later at around 5 a.m., Police received the following phone call from that same chauffeur. 911, what are you reporting? Hi, it's, uh, my name is Adriano. I, I think my boss killed somebody. Please, can, can you send me a... Uh, a Do you think your boss killed somebody? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because well, I'm a driver, I'm waiting outside and I don't know what. Now, why do you believe he may have killed somebody? Because you you have a lady on the, on the floor and he has a gun on, the, on his hand. Okay, and your boss's name? It's a few Spectre. 
So police raced round to the castle and they wait outside, the police are talking to each other just planning how they were going to approach this situation and they were watching the castle they were seeing if anyone was still inside and that was when they saw someone walking around upstairs so they knew someone was still alive in there and they knew they had to approach with caution in case this person was dangerous so they called in backup and police surrounded this castle and they were just about to go in when Phil Spector comes stumbling outside to the police. He was very clearly intoxicated. He was stumbling around all over the place, telling police to come inside, saying they're not gonna believe what they're gonna see inside. Police were, of course, telling him to put his hands up because this was a potentially dangerous situation, and he did, but because he was so intoxicated, he kept forgetting to keep his hands up. Like, I think he was forgetting what the situation was and he kept putting them down in his pockets again and because he did this so many times like took his hands from up here to his pockets police were scared that maybe he had a weapon or a gun on him or something and so they tried to taser him so like you know them tasers that you can shoot from afar and they did it but the taser misfired so they tried again it misfired again so eventually they managed to get up close with him they tasered him like properly to the skin and managed to tackle him to the ground and handcuff him. Phil Spector was arrested then and there on site and he was transported to the police station. Meanwhile, the rest of the police officers at the scene began entering the house to assess the situation. And in one of the first rooms police went in, there they found Lana Clarkson slumped in a chair, dead from a gunshot wound to the mouth. Now, just a warning before we carry on because I know a lot of you like to research the cases that I cover like further, so you'll watch the video and then go research it yourself. Um, just a warning though, there are a lot of pictures of the crime scene of Lana Clarkson's body online, like how they found it. And I just kind of wish I'd had that warning before I started researching because I wasn't expecting it. They're in some documentaries as well, just like they're not blurred or anything, it's just straight up flashed on screen a picture of a dead body. So if you don't want to see anything like that, just be careful, maybe don't research this one. Meanwhile, back at the police station, Phil Spector is still very intoxicated, although police are trying to get some kind of idea of what has gone on. So they're asking him like, what happened that night? Who is Lana? How did she die? So Phil Spector's version of events was that he went out that night, of course he was very drunk, he met Lana at the House of Blues and decided to invite her back to his house. And everything was fine up until that point, but at one point when Lana was at home with Phil, she walks over to one of his like cabinets of drawers, opens a drawer, takes out one of his guns, goes and sits down in a chair and just shoots herself with it. She commits suicide in his home with his gun. And the way that Phil Spector was telling this story to police was very insensitive. It was like he was angry at Lana for supposedly doing this. He even acted it out to police, which is incredibly insensitive. But what do we always say about hand gestures and body language when people are lying? Often when people are telling a story that is not true, they will use excessive hand gestures, such as making a gun with their fingers, such as pretending to shoot themselves in the head, because they want to seem more confident in the things that they're saying. If they seem more confident, other people are more likely to believe their lies. But that wasn't the only insensitive thing that Phil Spector did in his questioning. I'm going to play some audio here, and it's just insane. Although, as Phil Spector began sobering up in the police station, I think he realised what he was doing and he realised he needed to stay quiet. And so he told police that he wasn't going to say it anymore until he got a lawyer. Meanwhile, back at the crime scene, police are finding all these different components of the murder. They find one drawer, just one drawer, was open in the whole house and that was the one where the gun had come from. There was an empty holster in there. And the gun itself was found under Lana's ankle as if she'd just kind of dropped it after she'd shot herself. When they searched the rest of the house, police found nine more different firearms which, like I said, Phil Spector liked to carry a gun with him at all times for 
I don't know, power purposes to scare people. So Phil Spector is in police custody, he's waiting for a lawyer and everything, but meanwhile he decides to contact his kind of right hand man, his personal assistant Michelle Blaine. Now Michelle, while she was his personal assistant, she was also like his closest an only friend. Like I said, the only friends he really had were work associates and because he spent so much time with his personal assistant, Michelle just kind of became his best friend. In fact, you know I said the chauffeur was the one that called the police that night. Well, before he did call the police, he actually called Michelle and informed her what had just happened. However, she was asleep, she didn't answer her phone, it was 5 a.m. But because Spectre was already in police custody at this point, she couldn't actually speak to him or get to him until he was actually released on bail. Now, his bail was set at $1 million and because he is Phil Spector and because he was so wealthy, he could make that $1 million bail. So Spector was released from police custody, however, he couldn't go back to his house because it was a crime scene, obviously. So instead, he and his assistant, Michelle, had to go into hiding at the Bel Air Hotel. And there, when they were in this hotel room, Michelle sat Phil Spector down and just tried to ask him straight up, like, what had happened? Who was Lana? What went down that night? And all Spectre could tell her was that he didn't know and it was an accident. He just kept repeating those two phrases whenever Michelle would ever ask him anything and it just wasn't making sense to her, but that's all he was saying. Before long, the crime scene was cleaned up and Phil Spector was allowed to move back into his house. However, he was still sticking to that same story that Lana was fine up until she came into his house and just committed suicide. However, at this point, Lana's body had already had an autopsy and her death was ruled as a homicide. They did look into the suicide theory for a bit, obviously, because it's only fair to look at every possible explanation. They thought that maybe it was possible that Lana was depressed. She had been an actress at one point, but now she could no longer make ends meet. She had to get a job as a nightclub hostess. They thought that maybe she missed the limelight and maybe she felt like she failed and didn't reach her full potential in her career. And so she just got depressed and was suicidal. But after speaking with her friends and family, they realised that she wasn't depressed, she wasn't suicidal, she was pretty happy. She was actually pretty hopeful in this new job. Like I said, she'd only been on the job three weeks and she was just waiting to meet the right person. Everyone just said it was very out of the blue. There didn't seem to be any motive for her to want to take her own life. She was pretty happy. The autopsy showed that her blood alcohol level was pretty high when she died, so they had probably had multiple drinks at the castle. They'd been there for about two hours, so they were probably drinking, and she actually died from a gunshot wound to the mouth, like I said, but it was so severe that her teeth were blown to bits and they were just scattered on the carpet in that room. Anyway, in November of 2003, police felt that they had enough evidence to say that this was a homicide done by Phil Spector and so they charged him with second degree murder and this whole thing was due to go to court. Now, Phil Spector at this point had got himself a lawyer, but not just any lawyer, he got himself Robert Shapiro. Now, if you don't know who Robert Shapiro is, he was one of the kind of dream team lawyers that successfully defended OJ Simpson on his murder trial. So this man was a very, very good lawyer. He'd already gotten OJ Simpson out of a murder charge when it was looking so likely that OJ would be sent down for murder. Now, Shapiro's first move as a lawyer was to create a wall of press at every single court hearing that Phil Spector had. That way he could voice their side of the story to the press and that would be the one that would be reported first, Phil Spector's side rather than the prosecution. And one of the main things that Shapiro emphasised every time they were talking to the press was that there was no eyewitnesses. So it was literally just police's word against Phil Spector's. So even though the evidence did look pretty bad against Phil Spector, it was just word against word. But before long, I don't know for what reason, Phil Spector decided to drop Robert Shapiro as his lawyer. Instead, he hired Leslie Abramson, a defence attorney famous for defending one of the Menendez brothers. Again, 
a prolific murderer. Although Phil Spector and Leslie Abramson did not work well together, they just didn't gel. In a lot of murder cases like this, where the client looks very guilty and it's a very close call that they might not be able to defend them, the lawyer will tell the client to stay quiet at all times, just let the lawyer talk. And Leslie will have said that to Phil Spector and so when she's standing at the front and saying her thing, Phil kept interrupting her and correcting her and saying different things and adding to it. And she is repeatedly telling him in all of these like court hearings and videos that you'll see online, she keeps turning to him and saying, shut up. They just didn't work well together and Leslie did not want Phil Spector sabotaging this case, not only for himself, but for her. That looks bad on her that she would not be able to defend someone like that. And so she dropped out as well. Now, Phil Spector started looking for a third lawyer, but it was going to take him a little bit longer because he needed a good one. He needed a famous one. And so between the time of his second and third lawyer, of course, he had no representation but he still wanted to defend himself in front of the public and so once again he turned to his right hand woman Michelle. He called her and said look I want you to make a website and I want you to set me up a camera. I'm just gonna basically talk to this camera, tell my story, defend myself and I want you Michelle to put this online. So she did, she set up this camera, she let him talk and it was a mess. Unfortunately, I don't think I can put any clips in here, but it is online. There are very short clips online in like different documentaries and stuff if you wanna go and watch that. But he's not defending himself from like an emotional point of view, he's defending himself from a lawyer kind of point of view. So it doesn't look genuine. He's saying like, why would I kill her? I didn't have a motive, I need a motive to kill someone when instead of saying that you should be saying like I would never kill someone like I have a heart of gold instead he was being like well I don't I didn't have a motive so I didn't do it I don't know if that makes sense but he was coming at it from a very like cold glazed over point of view he was being very objective when a defense video if you're gonna make it yourself should be a little bit more emotional I think these videos that he sat and made never actually made it onto a website they've only come out since then in like documentaries and stuff Michelle never actually put them on the website I don't know if that was her call to make or if it was like a lawyer's call to make or something but they never made it onto this website like Phil wanted them to anyway Phil Spector finally managed to get himself a third and final lawyer and this man was called Bruce Cutler and Bruce Cutler again was a very very good lawyer very famous lawyer he managed to successfully defend one of the biggest mafia bosses in the whole of New York three times three times he was very good at what he did and like I said he was from New York where their kind of style of defense is very loud so in the courtroom he'd be shouting he'd be using his arms he'd be pointing and in LA, because this trial was going on in LA, even though he was a New York lawyer, in LA, that's not really how they do things. And the judge on this trial, Phil Spector's trial, felt that Bruce Cutler was being very disrespectful. He was disrespecting the judge and the court and the jury, the witnesses. He just didn't like how Cutler went about things. And so that already didn't bode well for Spector. It was making his side look very aggressive and defensive and kind of like they were overcompensating. So the prosecution, the side that was fighting for Lana saying that she didn't kill herself and that this was murder, they tried to argue that Phil Spector was just a generally violent and aggressive person. And to do this, they decided to call up multiple different women, like six or seven different women that had personal stories with Phil Spector where he had been aggressive or violent. Each of these women took to the stand and told the court of times when Phil had pulled a gun on them, tried to rape them, tried to lock them up, told them he'd kill them, tons of horrendous things. And like I said, there were like six or seven different women. So when there's that many people having very similar stories, Again, it just didn't look good. Another one of the prosecution's points was that Lana couldn't have just randomly killed herself because she didn't know where Phil Spector kept his guns. This was a house that she'd never been to before and if she was really suicidal, surely she would have taken one of the guns that was on display because he had them on display. But no, instead, in this whole house, there was just one drawer open 
and this one drawer just so happened to be the drawer that he kept a lot of his guns in. It's not like it was just on show and she was feeling suicidal in the moment and she grabbed it and shot herself. It's like she went to this specific drawer, picked out a specific gun, went and sat down and did this. It just didn't seem likely. As for crime scene evidence, now this one is really good. This is my favourite piece of evidence. So say Lana killed herself downstairs in one of the rooms the blood would be very contained to that one area because she can't spread it, can she? So tell me how there was blood on loads of different doorknobs in the castle and all the way up the stairwell, like up the banister on the stairwell as if it was on someone's hand and they'd walked up the stairs. In the bathroom, they also found a wet towel in the sink, another blood spotted towel and in Phil Spector's wardrobe, they found a coat with blood spotting on it. Now, as for the gun itself, again, this is a kicker piece of evidence. The gun itself that was found underneath Lana's ankle as if she'd just dropped it after shooting herself had no fingerprints on it at all. Surely it would have Lana's on them if she'd just dropped it and that was where police found it. It seemed as though this gun had been wiped. It didn't have Phil's fingerprints on it, it didn't have Lana's, it didn't have anything on it. So why would Phil Spector bother wiping down the gun if this was just a suicide and everything was innocent? So the prosecution theorised why Phil Spector would have wanted to murder Lana. They said that he brought her home from the club, maybe he wanted to sleep with her, maybe she wanted to leave and go back home but he didn't want her to leave. And so she got up to leave the house and he went and grabbed a gun and shot her. Now this does make sense because when Lana's body was found, she was found with her handbag over her shoulder. Now you don't just sit in the house with your handbag over your shoulder, you grab it when you're going to leave. Especially if she was about to kill herself, why would she go and put her bag on her shoulder to do that? They argued that Spectre was very intoxicated, he grabbed this gun to threaten Lana as he did with many of the women, although he never actually shot them before. And this time, they think he just went too far. He was just too pissed off, he was just too intoxicated, and he shot Lana Clarkson. As part of their argument, the prosecution then called up Phil Spector's chauffeur to come to the witness stand and they were gonna question him about that night. And this was the first time that the court had heard a witness testimony. Yes, he wasn't an eyewitness, but he was still there that night. And when I tell you the court was not expecting what they were about to hear, like this, okay, I know I said the last piece of evidence was my favorite piece of evidence, but this is insane. So the chauffeur sits there in the stand and tells his version of events that night from when he first met Lana to when he called the police. He told the court that Lana was not actually willing to go home with Phil Spector that night. Like I said, she protested, she said, oh no, I don't really know you that well, I want to go home. But apparently she did this quite a bit until she eventually just gave in. Up until now, everyone had assumed that Lana did want to go home with Phil Spector because all her family were saying this was what she was waiting for. She was waiting for a really important, famous person to make friends with her. And so they thought that she would have wanted to go back with him. But it turns out that that wasn't the case and Phil Spector literally had to beg Lana to come home with him. The chauffeur said that Lana didn't seem drunk at all and she wouldn't have been drunk because she'd been working and they're not allowed to drink on the job. And she kept saying over and over again to Spector that she was only coming around for one drink and then she needed to go home, like it was late, she needed to be back in bed. And when she tried to speak to the chauffeur at one point, Spectre got really mad. He snapped and he said, you don't talk to the chauffeur. The drive back to the castle was around 20 to 30 minutes long and in the back of the limo, Lana and Spectre sat and watched a film, but not just any movie. This movie was Kiss Tomorrow Goodbye, which is just so eerie. So they all get back to the castle. The chauffeur escorts Lana and Phil Spectre into the castle and he goes back out to the car to wait for her because like I said, she'd been emphasizing that she was only going in for one drink. So the chauffeur thought that it was gonna be really quick and then he'd end up giving her a ride back home. 
However, the chauffeur ended up sitting in the car for two hours. They got home around 2.30 and he ended up calling the police at five in the morning. And then at 5 a.m. when he was sat in the car, he heard what he described as a loud noise. But of course, in retrospect, it was probably the gunshot. So the chauffeur gets out of the car, he heads towards the house to figure out what's going on. And just before he gets to the door, he is met by Phil Spector stumbling out of the house drunk with a gun in his hand, covered in blood, saying, I think I just killed someone. And the chauffeur sat there in court and told this story and no one had ever heard this story or this point of view yet in the case at all. Now, Phil Spector's defence, Bruce Cutler, tried to argue this by saying that the chauffeur hadn't understood what Spector was saying properly. Bruce Cutler tried to say that Phil Spector had said, I think someone was killed, not I think I killed someone. And while English wasn't the chauffeur's first language, he had an accent and everything, he still spoke it pretty well and there'd never been language barriers before. Like there wasn't language barriers at any point during the court case, so it just seemed very strange that there happened to be one very serious language barrier on one night when there'd never been any before. Like it just seemed very convenient. So anyway, the court hearing finished and the jury went to deliberate and while it seems to me and you, very obvious what we would say in this situation, guilty or not guilty, to the jury it didn't seem that obvious. And they came back and they were deadlocked. Half of them thought that Phil Spector was guilty and half of them thought that he was not guilty. So the judge ruled it a mistrial and the whole thing had to be done all over again. So this gave both sides enough time to go off and try and find some more evidence, try and find some more arguments. But before we get into the new evidence, there was one thing that happened between these two trials which is honestly just laughable. Like, you'll find this genuinely funny. Between the two trials, after the failed one and before the new one, Phil Spector turns to his personal assistant, Michelle, and asks her to marry him. Now, these two weren't in a relationship, they'd never been romantic before, she had her own kids and everything, and this just seemed very out of nowhere for no reason, like, it was so out of the blue. And so Michelle said, no, I'm not gonna marry her, why, why would you ask me that? And so Phil Spector said to Michelle that he would feel a lot safer if they were married because she knew a lot of secrets about him and in court, spouses, like husbands, wives, whatever, you know, if it's like legal marriage, they can't testify against each other in court. And he was thinking, like, what if Michelle turns on me just like the chauffeur did? And so he tried to get her to marry him between the trials so that just in case she wanted to go against him and tell all the secrets that she had against him, she couldn't because she'd be his wife. Anyway, Michelle said, no, I'm not going to marry you. Like, she was saying, like, I'm loyal to you regardless. We don't need to get married for me to stay loyal to you. Like, she wasn't going to tell his secrets. And I don't know what secrets she had. I don't know if she has ever told these secrets. I don't know if she's still holding secrets. So that's kind of interesting to me, but also just really stupid. So anyway, the second trial began and the prosecution, as part of their efforts to try and sway the jury once again, they decided to have Phil Spector's coat from that night analysed. Because if you remember, they went up to his bedroom and found a coat in his wardrobe with blood spotting on it. And so they thought, well, if that's from the night of Lana's murder, we probably need to analyse that. Now, these blood spatters were tiny and there weren't that many of them. So it seemed unlikely that someone that shot another human being would have such a little amount of blood on them, if that makes sense. Like, surely if he, if he shot her, he would have more blood on him, is what I'm trying to say. But analysts looked at this coat and said, no, that kind of makes sense because he could have been stood at this angle, slightly like sideways on. And of course, if you shoot someone this way, the blood is gonna go out of their body that way. Like that's so gruesome, but it makes sense. It's not like when you shoot something, the blood goes like that. It goes in the direction that the bullet is going in. So if he was like stood to the side, he would barely get any 
spatter on him. But what they could tell from this blood spatter was that he was probably stood in a very close proximity to Lana when she was shot. Which of course makes sense if he murdered her. Of course you'd be stood close to someone that you're trying to kill. But if we look at the suicide theory that he is trying to push, why would you be standing so close to someone as they are committing suicide? The only time I could think that you would be close to someone who is committing suicide is if you are trying to stop them. However, the way that he talked about Lana and the way that he talked about this suicide, suicide, in his police questioning seemed as though he really didn't care. He didn't seem like he was the type of person to try and stop someone from committing suicide. He didn't seem emotionally affected by it at all, so... I don't know, doesn't seem to me like he was trying to stop her. Meanwhile, the defence, Bruce Cutler, was still trying to argue that Lana was suicidal. They pulled up her medical records and found that she was actually on a certain medication at the time. Now, I don't know what this medication was for, but they said that this medication mixed with alcohol, now we know she was drinking that night because her blood alcohol level was quite high. This medication mixed with alcohol can lead to chemical imbalances, making someone just very suddenly down. And they said that in the moment, Lana was already very sad in her day-to-day -day life. She was a failed actress. She'd had to take up a job to make ends meet. They said that she was sad anyway, but as soon as the alcohol entered her system, she became suicidal and killed herself. But the prosecution, Lana's side, argued that by bringing Lana's own mother to the stand. On the day of Lana's murder, her and her mother had been out shopping that day and Lana had bought a new pair of shoes for work. And she was actually really excited about these shoes. She thought they were really nice. She was excited to wear them at work. Now, if someone is planning to kill themselves, the second they see a gun, the second they get an opportunity to kill themselves, if they walk into someone's house and this person seems to have a gun, just like Phil Spector, if someone is planning on committing suicide, they're probably not gonna buy a new pair of shoes for work because they know they're not gonna need to wear them. And with that, the jury went to deliberate for a second time. This was a different jury entirely, by the way. They're not allowed to use the same jury again just in case you thought that. So the jury came back for the second and final time. At this point, it was six years since Lana's murder and we finally had a concrete verdict. On April 13th, 2009, Phil Spector was found guilty of the second degree murder of Lana Clarkson. He was sentenced to 19 years to life in prison, so a minimum of 19 years, but at this point, he was 69 years old. I think, or 66, I don't know, my maths is not good. Anyway, he was in his late 60s, and if he had a minimum of 19 years to serve, that means he's gonna be very old and frail by the time he leaves prison, if he does ever leave prison. It's 19 years to life, so he could be in there for the rest of his life. But still, to this day, Phil Spector and his team and Bruce Cutler and all of his defense claim that she killed herself, that Phil never had a part in her death. But I mean, all the evidence is there, so. Lana's family have since sued Phil Spector and his whole kind of estate and everything for the wrongful death of Lana. And they did win this lawsuit. However, the amount of money that they were paid out is not public information. I assume it was quite a lot though. And you know, Rightly so. But yeah, that's it for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. As for today's charity shout out, I want to talk about the Little Princess Trust. I'm sure a lot of you have already heard of the Little Princess Trust, but it's a charity over here in the UK that helped to provide real hair wigs to children and young adults up to the age of 24 that might have lost their hair due to cancer treatments or just other conditions that might make them lose their hair. Not only do they provide the wigs and make the wigs and everything, they also have specific salons where the wigs are fitted and chosen for these young people. And the whole kind of purpose of that is to give these people back their confidence. Not only are they battling such terrifying diseases, but they're also losing all their self-confidence and their self-esteem in their appearance. It's the least they need is a little bit of confidence. Not only do they make the wigs, but the Little Princess Trust also help to fund and look into research for less aggressive treatment for cancer and for different conditions. Because if they can look into the research, there'll be no need for the 
wigs and stuff like that because hopefully one day treatment won't cause hair loss. Since 2006, the Little Princess Trust have provided over 8,000 wigs for young people and they've also invested at least £5 million into different kind of research and treatment things. Now, this charity is a little bit different because not only can you donate money to go towards the research and the funding and everything and the creation of the wigs, but you can also donate your own human hair to have a wig made out of. All the information about donating hair and stuff is on their website, which is of course linked down below. I'm not gonna go into it in this video because I feel like that's kind of more niche. But yeah, the link to donate money as well to the Little Princess Trust will be down in the description. A lovely, lovely charity. I think it's so, such a good idea as well to give these people back their confidence and their self-esteem and try and pick them up a little bit when they're going through such horrendous things. Thanks again to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video. If you want to go and get your custom made shampoo and conditioner, click the link down below in the description for 20% off your first order. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video. Make sure you leave a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it and subscribe down below if you want to see some more from me. I make true crime videos like this all the time and my schedule is getting better, isn't it? There's been two videos in like less than a week this week. I mean, don't get used to it, but I'm trying. <laughs> a huge thank you to all of my channel members. All of the names are on screen right now. If you'd like to become a channel member, you can click the join button under the video if you're on a desktop, or if you can't find the join button, there'll be a link in the description. If you become a channel member, you'll get access to a bunch of extra perks. You get your name on this end screen at the end of all of my videos. You get access to a members only community tab where we talk about the cases. You can suggest cases for me to cover on my channel and you get your suggestions fast tracked. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Subscribe to my second channel. I'm posting on there again. There'll be a video in like a few days. But yeah, thanks, bye. <laughs>